Mm. Obviously, uh, even though I'm trying my best to sort of um, make our conversation as accessible and um, comprehensible. Um, without using too much Buddhist jargon and also trying to in, um, also um, using some analogy that is relatable in the current time. Um, obviously, uh, I will be doing it, I will try anyway, I'll be trying to do it as authentic as possible to the words of the Buddha that are found in the sutras and the shastras. This is uh, my job. Um, because otherwise, things get degenerated a lot. Recently I was in Bali and I went to a yoga I, every morning for a few days I've been to a yoga class and you know I've been to yoga teachings in, in India a long time ago from the actual Indian yoga masters. But this time when I was in Bali, uh, with the Indian yoga masters, you know, things takes time and they have so many other paraphernalia, Indian things. Now in Bali, it's very well packaged. So it's very easy and accessible. Relatable. But then, towards the end of the yoga, when everything's finished, we all have to sit like this and then be say, okay, so the yoga master says, let us now love ourselves. <laughs> That's what he said. So, this Indonesian yoga master, obviously trying to cater and suit the people. <clears throat> I don't think in the Yoga Sutras of the India there is this <laughs> love myself. But I think this may have come from ex New Age Californian. I have a strong feeling. <laughs> yoga is a good example. Not many people know that yoga is a very serious business. It has now become a, just a beautifying, slimming. It's a something to do with a, just a pure health, uh, physical health thing. And of course, everybody wants to be slim and look, wants to look beautiful, so that sells, of course. But yoga is much more.
the meaning of the word yoga is actually quite profound. One of the meaning is really to do with finding the balance. We are not talking about balancing, you know, like on one feet or something like that. That's the least important balance. Balance in life, balance in thinking, balance in everything. Especially, you know, if it is a Buddhist yoga, balance in between the samsara and the nirvana. Balance between paranoia and uh, awaken. So on and so forth. This is important. Um, if I teach back home in Bhutan how to make taco, I should really teach the prop, you know, try my best to teach how Mexicans make taco. If I eat a taco and then open my stomach and then take out the digested taco and tell the Bhutanese, this is taco, you cannot really dispute that it is not. <laughs> it is a taco. But down the line, you have lost a lot. <laughs> you understand? And this is why I want to come back to the, the Buddhist stuff. There are a lot of thieves, plagiarists. There are a lot of people who use mindfulness and, you know, ideas, so many. And they claim that these ideas came from their own head, somehow, some sort of a revelation. I have a little doubt, but I have a mixed feelings with them. In one hand, this is good. Anyway, the lamas from Tibet and Bhutan and Nepal, they are terrible in packaging. They really don't know how to sort of market the wisdom of the Buddha. They teach Buddhism just as how they teach a Bhutanese or a Tibetan 500 years ago. Things have changed. So, somebody is doing a job. You know, people are, you know, mindfulness this, mindfulness that, you know. So, I have, you know, I close one eye. It's good. Because among these people who participate in this mindfulness program, some of these will be, become more curious and they want to advance more. So they will enter into more serious path, such as Advaita, even, you know, not necessarily Buddhism, or Jain, Jainism. And of course, Buddhism has a lot of system of what to do with the mind. Not just mindfulness, but mind training. And not just mindfulness and mind training, but knowing the mind. That's actually much more important. Knowing the mind is actually the sort of, if you like, the aim. Not just being mindful, not just mind training. So there's a whole system of that. So I'm always coming, I will try to come back to that. Because I think... It is important that you know. <clears throat> okay. In the sutras, when we read sutras, there are a lot of stories and events. And many times in the events, we read words like Chö Namla, Chö Ji, Migdul Dang, Tarjing. This is in Tibetan, of course. What it means is, you know, when, you know there, are, there are stories like so and so went to see the Buddha. He or she had a conversation with the Buddha. Or he or she looked at Buddha and upon seeing him, meaning that kind of blessing, the series of blessing, 
you know, set down for one yamba, Namka down Lanti yamba. Or things like Demba, Tongo. There are so many kind of sort of categories of blessings they receive. And these words are priceless. For instance, Chunam the Church, Middle Dam Tal. What it means is, so and so have gone to see this, see the Shakyamuni Buddha, and after having the conversation, this person had received the blessing of looking at things, but from now without the dust or the veil or the, what do you call it, filter between the, sub, uh, between the one that sees the phenomena and the phenomena. You know, we are not talking about the blessing of halo. We are not talking about the blessing of some supernatural. It's a very, very down to earth. When we look at things, we always look at things through the filter, through the veil, veil of all kinds, which we have collected from the education, upbringing, culture, habitual, just so many. And then phrase like Demba uh, Tong, which is a very standard one. So and so have been to see the Buddha, and not only the Buddha, actually even the Arhats. So and so have been to see the Arhats. Oh, one very good example, Utpala, beautiful girl. She became nun. She is considered so beautiful, and. Um, even before, I mean, definitely before she become, she was nun. She was just famed for being so beautiful, so beautiful like a flower. Utpala, Utpala is something like a blue uh, lotus, I think. I guess considered very rare and very beautiful. Anyway, she upon meeting the Buddha, she decided to become the nun. So after becoming nun, she shaved her hair, or you know, she has become renouncent. But <laughs> so there's this guy who has always been having infatuation with her for a long time, and then she was, and this man was uh, stalking her everywhere even after she became nun. And then one time, she was sort of frustrated and she asked the man straightforward, what is it that you like about me? Then she, he said, you know, because you are so beautiful. And then she said, which part? Which part of me is beautiful? And then he said, your eyes. And then she immediately took out her eyes and gave it to him. And Demba Tongo, the man saw the truth. Demba, in Tibetan word, is truth. So seeing the truth. Again, we are not talking about some mystical, mythical truth. We are talking about raw, very, very basic truth, such as all things are imp all compounded things are impermanent, so on and so forth. Very, very, the truth that is so here now and then there okay then there is so and so have been to see the Buddha and then oh so many uh, phrases like Jundu Shukso Jundu Shukso meaning he has now entered into the stream he, he will not return Jundu Shukso is almost like just put it in a very simple way Upon seeing the Buddha and after receiving the teaching, he has seen this truth. And then it's almost like, that's it. This is it. You know, even in this case, in our case, for instance, yes, all compounded things are impermanent. That is, that is something that you cannot alter. You cannot return from that one. I mean, it's just not possible that one day, one of the compounded things will become permanent. You know what I mean? Complete confidence and complete trust in that. 
is like entering into the stream. And from, from you have so much trust in that truth that you will never return. You will never think that, oh, I will, you know, who knows? You know, maybe things are impermanent. You will never doubt. You will never return. And then as you progress, you know, as you see the truth more and more and more, then you also receive the blessings such as Serdam Pumanyamba, Langtidam Namkanyamba. This is quite a high blessing. But what it really means is Langtidam Namkanyamba means the size of the palm and the size of the sky has become equal. Meaning that someone who sees the truth looks at things that are dualistic, dualistically distinguished, such as tall, short, long, um, I don't know, short, um, thin, fat, many, little. All these dis dualistic distinctions are just a label that is so strongly habituated. We just think they are real, but actually they are not real. And when you know this, not only intellectually, but actually practically, size of the palm and the size of the sky has no difference. Handful of dust, said the Pohanyaba, handful of the dust and the kilo of a gold, no difference. This is <coughs> what Buddhists try to aim for through the mindfulness, mind training, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so seeing the truth is what we want. But what, why are we not seeing this truth? Even though it is so blatant, it's so here now, all the time. What is it? Why are we not seeing it? Why are we keep on missing it? Even though it is right in front of your nose. Distractions, remember? We talk about distractions. Okay, distractions. But then, why are these, why is there these distractions? Habit. So, now what do we do? Okay, we will not feed the distractions. We will cut the habit. We will jeopardize the habit. We will have economic embargo to this um, habit. We will uh, sterilize the habit. We will uh, throw in a few virus here and there, you know, uh, to this, uh, what do you call it, this, uh, what a habit. You know, already you did yesterday when you are like this. When you sit like this and just be aware of this stupid air conditioned sound. <laughs> you have already had a little bit of a virus on the habit. Because usually your habit wants, why would we listen to this air conditioned sound? Why would we do that? We would rather listen to some music or have a conversation. You understand? We will never have that kind of motivation. We, we won't think about, like, I don't know, noticing this. So what? You know, we, we always have this kind of, okay, next. No next. Just this. So, so on and so forth. We then weaken the habit, derail the habit, make the habit, habit confuse. This is the aim. Okay, but, okay, but Shantadeva gave us a strategy. He said, She said, In order to see the truth, oh, by the way, seeing the truth is what basically what seeing the truth is what vipassana means. Vipassana, I guess in Sanskrit means seeing something extra or something you know beyond more than the 
sort of more than the face value, just something beyond seeing extra. Only through seeing the truth, only through vipassana, only by seeing the extra, you can cut the habit, cut the emotion. Therefore, you need vipassana. But for vipassana, you need shamatha. Because shamatha makes your mind malleable. Now, I need to talk about the word versus. You know our title, peyote versus what? This, versus, versus. How do you say versus in Spanish? I need to know this. Versus? Versus. What does it mean? Yes, very good. Now I'm happy. <laughs> so, against. Did you think about it? I, I really thought about I really, you know, carefully chosen that word, versus. Peyot, what was it? Peyote versus what? <laughs> I forgot. You know, anyway, versus everything. Versus, 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 you know. Shamatha versus Vipassana. Vipassana versus Mojito. Mojito versus Miriachi. Miriachi versus, you understand, peyote, peyote versus. Versus is a very, very important word for Buddhism. I mean, especially in this case. Whole Buddhist path is designed to cancel each other, so to speak. Chorus? Yes, I know. Shamatha is necessary to develop vipassana. This we, we agree. But shamatha and the vipassana cancels each other. This is actually a little bit, you know, like, <coughs> um, how should I call it? A little bit difficult, but I guess, you know, if you have time, we can um, uh, discuss about it. Okay, for instance, like, you know, you have heard us again and again in Buddhism, we just relentlessly talk about wisdom and method. Actually, wisdom and method are also wisdom versus method. Method, all kinds of method. And wisdom deconstructing all of this. And this is the backbone, soul, eyes, heart, lung, neck of Buddhism. You must have that. You must. If there is no wisdom and method, well, okay, uh, let me use a more positive language union. Whereas if there's no union of wisdom and method, no path of Buddhism. You understand? So important. So I will be giving, for instance, this flower, which is the method. I will, I will offer this flower to the Buddha. That's a method. But my wisdom should know there is no such thing as a flower. There is no such thing as me. There is no such thing as the Buddha. There is no such thing as a merit. It's all an illusion. See? That's the union. However you want to put, put it. I, this time I chose negative word, versus. But we can also choose positive word. Union of poverty and... Mo what was it? <laughs> Whatever you want to do. It, it, it doesn't, you know, it's basically, it's like this. Okay. I, don't, I just have to say this, it's, even though it's really nothing to do here. Most of the mindfulness thing that I have listened, you know, I, you know because I also, you know, as I said, I, I have a mixed feeling with all this mindfulness that's going on, you know, I also subscribe to them. You know, what are they doing? <laughs> so I have like headspace. 
I have all these mindfulness apps, and I listen to them, whole, you know, really carefully. What, what are they talking about? And they're good, they're really good. But I have to say, there is most of them, they don't seem to have these verses. You understand what I mean? Of course, if they have the verses, then they have no business. <laughs> Who would up, download an app? <laughs> you know, that is so stupid. You know, the, okay, this app is not going to work, sort of. You know, like, <laughs> they totally don't talk about that part. <coughs> so, for instance, shamatha. You know, what is shamatha? Shamatha is really... So most of the mindfulness that you find are sort of mediocre shamatha. Mediocre shamatha. It's very good already. I'm, I have rejoiced. But without the... Vipa, you know, shamatha is... Shamatha alone is nothing to do with Buddhism. If you don't have the vipassana... This is what Naropa said, the great Naropa said. If you want to have a clear water to drink out of a pond, drink or wash your face, if you want the water to be clear, you let it be first. All the mud will settle. Then you see the water. Then you drink. But your task is not finished because the mud is there sitting Sooner, one of these days, a goat might walk, or somebody will stir, and all the mud will come out. You understand? So, for that, you need the vipassana. Vipassana uproots the mud. Shamatha only settles the mud. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, enough of talking. We will now do a little bit of practice. We will today begin with a shamatha, but kind of very Buddhist, you know, influenced shamatha, anapati, anapanasati, kind of. And we will do it on breathing. Okay, so what do you do? Not yet. Okay, I'll just give you the instructions first. You, what do you do is you sit straight and you concentrate on your breathing. <coughs> your breath going out, in, out. You don't have to sort of contrive the breathing. Let it, let it just flow. You can also concentrate on, uh, you know, uh, sort of in the middle of the nostril, if you want. But basically, choose that as an object. Okay? This time, I'm not talking about being aware of noise, feeling, sensations. No. This time, your mind is to concentrate on breathing in and out. Let's, let's do this first. Okay, let's start.
Okay, let's stop for a while. Let's stop. If your experience is that you can't concentrate on the breathing, if you notice that you can't, then that's good. You need to know this. If you if you realize you cannot concentrate, that's good. Then you are doing the shamatha practice. If you think you have concentrated in, out, breathe in, out, I will doubt this a little bit. I will think, uh, okay, I will say, I will say, well, I hope so. But if you say, no, I can't concentrate, then you are concentrating. Then you are doing a good job. Okay, again, let's do this. Breathe in, Okay, stop again. This is important. You do short time, short many times, but short time. Therefore, your practice is fresh. Also, mm, Appetite for practice, you will not lose. You, you won't lose the appetite for practicing. Even if you really, really inspired, and especially for the beginners, even you are so inspired and really want to do it, do it for half an hour or one hour, I suggest not to. Let's say you have an hour of free time and you really want to do what do you call it? You want to do meditation, not to waste the time. I will say um, you should do 30 times of this and other 30 minutes. I don't know, read a book or watch a television or whatever. I mean, 
not like 30 minutes, 30 minutes. One minute, and one minute, like that. Or, this is up to you, maybe one minute is a bit, little bit too short. Maybe three minutes to five minutes. There is a name for that. Especially for the begin, beginners, it's, it's advice. There is a name for that, it's called, well, in Tibetan it's called Duzi Tanpa, which means uh, beginner's mind, when we, when beginner's mind, uh, when we ask them to do things like this, you know, things like concentrate on things that are kind of not gripping, like the sound of the air condition or the, you know, your air, then the craving for Input is very strong. The craving for some sort of a, you know, distraction is very strong. Now, there's a, when you deliberately di make yourself distract, habits don't like that. Remember, we, we want to put virus on the habits. Remember? That's our plan. Remember, we want them to make them sick. We want them to have a flu, basically. We want to, we, basically, we want, to, we, we, we want to cripple them. They love it when you got distracted and you don't even knew. <laughs> they love it. Then it's like, really, and that's like the vitamin for them. They, you know... You know, like, you, you drift, drift, drift. You are so distracted. Your mouth is open and there's a fly came into your mouth. And it even had a time to come out. And you still don't know. Then they have charged very well. So deliberately distracting is important. It's called Dutsi Tempa, taking the nectar. These are all found in the classic Buddhist texts. I'm not making these things up. Classic Buddhist texts. Okay, so next we are going to do this. So we are going to do Anapa, Anapanasati for a few minutes, maybe a minute and a half or two minutes, and then when I say stop, please think about, I don't know, whatever you, are, you want to think, deliberately think, don't sort of stay in this strange blissful mood. Don't do that. <laughs> this strange blissful mood is a trap, a spy by our enemies. You know, remember our, the habits, habits are our enemies? They send you the spies. They are very clever. I will, we will talk more about their strategy, but let's do this. Okay, a few minutes again.
Okay. Deliberately get distracted. Deliberately get distracted. <laughs> okay, let's do it again. Breathe in. Okay, again, deliberately get distracted. Have distractions, deliberate ones. Force it. Okay, D this Duchitemba, taking the nectar, deliberately getting distracted, is a little tough, not so easy. But I think you, you, you probably have got what I'm talking about. It's a very important. It actually, it should be considered as part of the meditation. You understand? Um, Okay, in the Shamatha, there's a language called Sem Lesurungwa or Xinjiang, they also say in Tibetan. Basically, your mind is not malleable. The distraction comes at its will whenever they want to. And then they become your Kim Jong Un. <laughs> you understand? They, they dictate your life. So what we are trying to do is we try to reverse the position. We want to be the Kim Jong-un. <laughs> of course. So for, for beginners, probably the actual, you know, sitting and breathing in and out may be easier than this deliberate Distractions is easier. But anyway, you know, we only have today and tomorrow. So I'm also giving you sort of, sort of the, like a crash, sort of, you know, put all things together. You know, these things take a bit of a time, you understand. So also, 
you know, your experience and the, your meditation instructors would also then guide you. But here, this time is like a sort of a, consider this as like an reading the menu, you know, or a sort of, but, you know, it's not that, it is not like a philosophically or academically difficult to understand. You, know, it's, you, you could, you could, it's like, the only thing is as you do that, a lot of different kinds of, exp lot of different kinds of, uh, okay, three stages. One is understanding. You will have an understanding. It's more intellectual understanding. Never ever think that that is experience. Understanding is an understanding, it's not an experience. You should never feel proud of your understanding. You need experience. And then when you have the experience, that again is a trap. Your experience is fickle. It's like a weather, it changes. It's again, don't settle with your experience. Your experience means nothing. Your experience is soggy. You know, your experience are, <laughs> you understand, stained. So what you really need to reach is realization, the actual realization. You got it? So, we are now going to do again, we, we will do this more, but this time, we are going to combine with, you know, we are galloping through a lot of methods. But should be okay for some of you. Uh, by all means, if, if you want to do this seriously, put, uh, you know, pay, uh, you know, maybe um, each of these methods uh, you can do, okay, maybe first week just, just sitting, like what we did yesterday. Second week, then breathing. Third week, be breathing and the deliberate distraction. Maybe it's not just third week, fourth week, fifth week. This is because this is kind of becoming big deal, you know. And then after that, we are now going to do. We are now going to do. Meditation and post meditation. How to how to use post meditation? Because you know, you have to do things, right? You have to. You are all. You have children. You have work. You have to travel. You have to. You know, you're busy. This is a human realm. You know, human realm in the living in the human realm. You have no choice, but you have to do something. Otherwise. You can't survive. So, how to combine, I mean, every morning or every evening sitting like this is fine for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but rest of the day, 23 hours and what, 80, no, what, um, 50 minutes of you know, distractions and going to the world is not really going to, you know, uh, have much effect. It will have an effect, but not, not, you know, not fast enough, not strong enough. So you need to know how to also have a technique on uh, post-meditation. So then you learn how to actually do this e you know, while you are being in the world. Okay? So what we are going to do is, again, anapanasati, breathing in, out, in, out, concentrate that. And then, as I say, stop. Usually there is no order, but this time since I'm, you know, I have to somehow guide through. After this, after I say stop, Look at 
things. Let's do with the looking. Did you bring your biscuits and you know, whatever? Okay, we will come to that. Look at things. For instance, like, have you ever looked at your toilet door knob? <laughs> See, you haven't looked at it. You understand? Or have you ever looked at your folded socks? Soggy socks? Have you ever looked at your pillow? I don't think so. Maybe you haven't. So this time we will just look. I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, or flowers, whatever. It doesn't matter. You can move also. You don't have to sit. You just look. Only look. No judgment. Oh, that pillar is beautiful. Oh, that's a brown. Who made this? All oh, no stories. Just look. You know, just looking. You understand? Okay. Again, first sitting. <sighs> Breathe in and out. Concentrate on your breathing. Okay, now just look. Don't get distracted, just look. Just look. Okay, let's stop. I will let you ask questions a little bit, just one more. No, two more, I think. We are doing a classic, traditional, really, really very, very elaborate sort of the Shamatha Vipassana. I haven't done this for some time. Maybe a long time ago, I did once in Australia or somewhere, I think, with people who are basically lying down when I was teaching. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do it again.
concentrate on breathing. If you are thinking about the past or thinking about the future or thinking about anything, just come back to the breathing. Concentrate on the breathing. No need to ask yourself, am I concentrating on breathing or not? Just concentrate on the breathing. If you have found yourself worried that you are distracted, just come back to the breathing. Okay, look at your food, whatever you have brought. Just look, don't eat. Just look. No need to label. No need to label that it's a peach or is round or rectangle. Just look. And now, smell. No need to like, no need to dislike, no need to label. Okay, don't eat. Deliberately get distracted to something else. Okay, stop. This looking at the food and smelling the food, you should teach to children. No need to let them sit, you know, like this. Just 30 seconds they can look and maybe 15 seconds they can smell. I'm not making these things up. <laughs> this is coming from the, you know, sutras and shastras. Okay, again, one more time. Uh, have your thing next to you.
I mean, ready. Okay, but first, again, breathing. And this time, I will guide you. Breathe in and out. If you found yourself distracted, don't get frustrated or regret. Just pick up from the point and concentrate on the breathing. If you are feeling dull or sleepy, don't get frustrated or worry, just come back to the breathing. Okay, put whatever thing in the mouth. Don't swallow, don't chew. Okay, now chew at least more than something like 30 times. All the while, just be aware of that. No labeling, no judgment. Okay, if you haven't already, now swallow. <laughs> this method, 
somehow ended up faded in Tibet. Because the Tibetans practice Mahayana Buddhism and the Vajrayana Buddhism. You understand? In the Vajrayana Buddhism, actually, this exists in the most highest form. Really, really highest form. Upanikrama, Sampanikrama, stuff like chok. But it has now all become sort of a ritual and, you know, Now, if you go to any tantric gathering when they are having a talk, it is probably the time that they are least mindful <laughs> because they are all busy distributing or whatever, whatever, you understand? <laughs> anyway, forget about that. In Tibetan, or Bhutan, all this Himalayas, they, but this is very much still alive in other traditions such as in Japan for instance but again in Japan they have this problem they always end up making it into some, something like a cultural like the Japanese tea ceremony it's a very 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 Buddhist based shamatha vipassana practice but now it has become a sort of a cultural thing to do sort of very elegant and ceremonial and all of that. There's no reason why you cannot do in Mexico do with something else. You can, you can do something, whatever you, you know, choose, a, choose, a, choose, a, choose an activity. Okay, the whole point, again, just to Mind, uh, remind you, the whole point is, remember, you want to see the truth? What is stopping you? Distraction? Who is feeding the dis distractions? The habit? So we want to weaken the habits. And how do we do that? Instead of playing its game, you adopt this path of non-responding, so to speak. You understand? You, you, basically, you're not playing its game anymore. You are really not getting caught up by its game. This post-meditation technique if you could do it in the bus, in the, even as short as five seconds, you should never think meditation has to be done long. These concepts like you have to sit long, you have to sit more than half an hour, all these are monastic influence. Yes, in the monastery, you know, there is a certain ritual, you know, Monastic influence, long and short, doesn't make any difference to be there, to be in the present, to be aware, to be conscious, that's what you need. But not playing its game, meaning not getting caught up, such as judgment, what is this, what is that, Don't, not doing that. Because as soon as you are doing that, you are recharging them. Okay, so if you have any questions, we can, you can ask some questions. And um, we'll take a break after a few questions. Yes, please. Yeah. You want to use the mic? Yeah. Oh, hello. Do you say something um, once like we have to work with a habit without obscure the truth? And I want to know how is that? Uh, we need to what? The first part. Work with the habit 
without obscure the truth. Uh, can you explain this a little bit more? Uh, um, okay. No, I don't think so. <laughs> so, work with a habit like you need to, okay, I will try to explain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll try to explain what, it, okay, so you try, see. Uh, mm, like, um, like, um, you need to, you need to, uh, get a job and, uh, because you need to survive and in the job, you need to make your boss happy and make sure that your colleagues are not too unhappy with you. Stuff like that are you talking about? Or are you talking about even more mundane things like we need to comb our hair? Mm -hmm. uh, you say that uh, in the Buddhism, the more important is the point of view or the, or the ultimate truth. Yeah. But... Um, but in the Hinayana and Mahayana, we have to do something, work with a habit. And yes. But it doesn't matter. All Yanas, their aim is to understand the truth. Are you talking about the discipline? Mm -hmm. Yes. The discipline varies. What I have been telling you is a very important discipline. That's, a, that's actually the essential discipline. This is actually more difficult discipline. Like discipline not to eat, or okay, not to eat meat or not to drink alcohol, actually is easier. This, disciplining of not getting distracted or deliberately distracted, or chew at least 50 times, this stuff is a little difficult. So discipline comes in the many, many ways. Okay, but um, work, it's important to kind of, what do you call it, try to not, try to, what do you call it, incorporate your practice with the work or responsibility, whatever you are doing, that's important, otherwise Meditation is not going to progress. Yes, please. Hello, uh, Rinpoche. Before I knew you from your teachings like months ago, I'm sorry, you are so famous and I didn't knew you. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and I say that because you, for me, you, I, I can identify me so well with you because you say, you know, I am a bad Buddhist, and that for me just put away all this, you know, you have to do the Nundro and Vajra Sattva like 30,000 mm -hmm. million times and so on. And um, I just want to confirm with you if, um, if I do as much as I can in my daily activities to try to be aware of what I am doing, either cutting uh, whatever, yes. and also doing these short times meditation, either with breathing and everything. Uh, I could be also enlightened. Very and, much. <laughs> Even Very if much. I am not doing, you know, like Vajrasattva, so complicated practices and... Uh. Okay, this <laughs> is a very big question you have asked. Mm, actually, mm, okay, this... Let's take a break first. <laughs> no! For 15 minutes. And then we, I will come back straight to answer you, okay? okay.